Hi, this is Chelsea and we're here at an undisclosed location or testing out the new Tamron 150 to 600 6.3. We're going to be putting it up against the Canon 500mm f4 and Madeline's using the Canon 400mm f5.6 Prime. We're going to see which one we like best and see if this is worth what your price is. And if you're curious about the Canon or Nikon 400mm zooms or the Sigma 500mm zoom, don't worry. Hold on tight and we'll address those later. We'll get to those soon. We'd scouted this location with the Osprey days earlier. We used sun tracking tools to identify the perfect time of day for front lighting, watched the weather reports for clear skies, and got up two hours before sunrise. It all went according to plan, except for the clouds. With soft light, you get soft pictures, and that just won't do for testing lenses. We did catch some flying birds and gave the autofocus systems a test. The Tamron 600 performed admirably on our 7D, 70D, and 5D Mark III. The hit rate was about the same as our 400 and 500 primes, which is the best we could have hoped. The rumors of autofocus problems with the 7D seem to be false. As a wildlife photographer, nature's always in control, and all you can do is be persistent. The sun came out on day two, and we were ready. What a difference direct sunlight at your back makes. With this Tamron 1.4X teleconverter on, it tries to autofocus, but just consistently fails. I'll try manually focusing. The manual focusing is nice and smooth with this lens, but with the teleconverter on at 600 millimeters, it was so unsharp I couldn't even tell when it was precisely in focus. He only occasionally pokes his head up, so I have to keep the camera up to my eye and wait for him to appear and then take a bunch of shots. And it's certainly easier with one of the smaller lenses to hold it up to my eye for so long. You want to time your movements for when the duck dives underwater and can't see you. Then you can move a few steps forward. But keep track of how long they stay underwater because you want to be still and hiding when they pop up again. Cold fingerless gloves with a touchscreen are a real good combination. People underestimate this touchscreen, but you can preview pictures and zoom in tight just by going like that. No pushing that magnify button over and over again. A pair of ducks just popped out of the grasses out of nowhere and I only had a second to respond. The way I handle that is whenever I stop taking pictures, I return my camera back to one two thousandths of a second and auto ISO and all the focus points. That allows me to just pick my camera up at any point and get a moving subject right away without having to change the settings. Put your camera at the settings that you'll need if you have to respond instantly. If you see a still subject, you can go always go back and change them. But when you have to respond, you want those settings. Oh, you got some great pictures of seagulls. Yeah, they did okay. Wow, I wish these were anything but seagull pictures. Well, I'd rather get an osprey, but they're not flying right now, so we came down to the shore and seagulls are better than nothing, right? By a hair. In our tests, the little Canon 400 f5.6 Prime was consistently sharper than the Tamron Zoom. We digitally zoomed 400 millimeters to 600 millimeters and performed a single blind test on our Stunning Digital Photography Readers Facebook group. More than dozens of STP readers chimed in giving their assessment of the sharpness, and it was just about unanimous. The 400 Prime is sharper even at 600 millimeters. I like that I can lock the lens at any focal length. So if I decide that 400 is the sharpest, I can just lock it at 400 and not worry about it wiggling around at all. 
You can also use that to lock it closed so it doesn't drift while it's hanging upside down. I have the focus limiter on. So I have it set to 15 meters to infinity, so about 45 feet to infinity for the flying birds that I know are farther away. For the close-up work, I'll switch it to full, but this will make the focusing faster. Most lenses have that. The autofocus is working really well, but when I do need to resort to the manual focusing, like when I need to focus through branches, it works really fast and smooth. And in fact, I uh, like it even better than the 100 to 400 zoom with the push-pull focusing, though I actually am one of the fans of that system. Uh, I find this to be just a little faster and more efficient. VC is Tamron's version of image stabilization. It stands for vibration control. And I'm thrilled that this lens has it because my Canon 400 Prime does not. And that means that I can handhold at slower speeds. And with my other lenses, I frequently go down to 1 90th of a second. Now, for flying birds, it doesn't really make a difference because you have to use a fast shutter speed anyway. But for stationary animals, it lets you use a lower ISO, and that can get you better pictures. At 1 1 25th of a second and below, I got 30% sharp with the Canon 400 Prime and 75% sharp with the Tamron's vibration control. Another way you can prepare for a bird to suddenly appear is to pre-focus where you think the bird is going to be. It could be literally impossible to find the bird in the frame if your camera is focused really close up or really far away. But when you're waiting for a bird to pop up, focus in the rough area so that when you look through the viewfinder, it won't be completely blurry. It's a big boy next to this 400 millimeter though. Yeah. We'll see, it's all about the sharpness, right? So did we put a teleconverter on the 400 millimeter to see if it could compare to this? Not yet. That's something we'll have to do. That's a good idea. So the 5D Mark III will autofocus at f8. So we tried putting a 1.4x teleconverter on this 400 f5.6 prime and pitting it against this at 600 millimeters and f6.7. So let's see how those compared. With a 1.4x teleconverter, the 400 prime becomes a 560 millimeter f8. It was still noticeably sharper than the Tamron 600 f6.7. It's also more durable, lighter, and thus easier to hand hold for long periods of time. It actually looks really good. Yeah, I like that lens with the teleconverter. I just wish I could use all the focus points. have the right light to get pictures of an osprey. So let's go. A lab test of the lenses would only take 10 minutes, but we don't care which lens makes a resolution chart looks great. We care how the lenses perform in the real world, how they pack and travel, how they hand hold, and if any sharpness differences are still visible, we factor in atmospheric conditions and animal movements. Every lens has a sweet spot, a focal length and aperture that make the sharpest pictures. To find the sharpest focal length, I took pictures of the same subjects at a variety of different focal lengths and then digitally zoomed them to the same resolution. I did this with six different subjects in different lighting conditions. To my eye, the 600 millimeter shows just a tiny bit more detail than 500 millimeters. If you're having a hard time keeping the subject in the frame at 600 millimeters, don't hesitate to zoom back to 500. The amount of detail you lose is almost nothing. To find the sharpest aperture, I took pictures of a swan, rabbit, and osprey starting at a wide open f5.6 and gradually shutting the aperture down to f19. In the real world, the sharpness difference wasn't noticeable for most subjects. The fur on the rabbit seemed a hair sharper at f8 or f95 than it did wide open. Shutting down the aperture changes two other aspects of the photo, one good and one bad. The good benefit is adding more depth of field, which means more of your subject is in focus. The eyes and the wingtips can all be in focus. You can see this by looking at how much of the grass is in focus in these pictures. The bad aspect is that higher f-stop numbers reduce incoming light, requiring you to use a higher ISO. 
the higher ISOs reduce image quality by adding noise. So you have to balance ISO noise with depth of field and lens sharpness. If you have enough light to shoot at ISO 400 or below, choose an aperture of f8 to f11. If that requires you to raise your ISO above 400, open up the aperture to its maximum value and know you won't be losing too much sharpness. So we've had a ton of hands-on experience and now we can review what we learned and tell you the pros and cons of each lens. Yeah, you know, I, I love that Tamron. I thought it was extremely versatile, uh, quite sharp. I like the image stabilization. It's pretty easily hand-holdable and the price is right. I mean, it's still a lot, $1,070. $1,070, but for a 600 millimeter lens, yeah. that's a good deal. It's a fantastic deal. Um, at the same time, when compared with the 400 millimeter prime, we saw some cons with the Tamron 600 millimeter. Yeah, this lens had IS, yeah. which made it a little more handholdable at slow shutter speeds, which aren't actually all that common with wildlife photography. But this lens, the 400 millimeter, was sharper at 400 millimeters, 500 millimeters, and 600 millimeters, like right. a lot sharper. So I actually found shooting the Tamron at 600 millimeters, everything looks soft. And so I zoomed in on my LCD screen, it looks soft, but I thought I have to get on the computer. And when we looked on the computer, sure enough, it was soft. It's not completely sharp at 600 millimeters. Nor so at 400 or 500. So I feel like it's a little bit misleading. I don't think anyone would get this lens and think and be disappointed. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a little curious to see how it sells too, because I think the appeal might be that it says it's 600 millimeters and it's a big professional looking lens. Because uh -huh. I think this might actually be a better option for a lot of people, but yeah. it's 400 millimeters and it's smaller and it's prime. Well, if you can call this a 600 millimeter lens, then that's a 700 millimeter lens. Because <laughs> it's sharper even at 600 millimeters, even when you crop it down. Even with a teleconverter on it. Yep. Sharper. Lighter and sharper, a little bit lighter. Um, so a lot of people will say, but it's not all about sharpness, Tony. And that's totally true. And no, in most true. photography, you, you know, if you're doing portraits, you can get as close to your subject as you want and fill the frame. Right, Same with landscapes. With wildlife photography, you're always filling the frame and you zoom in a lot. You want to get as close as possible. Yeah, you're almost never filling the frame because animals don't love us like we love them. <laughs> so yeah. you end up cropping and that means you're putting so much more uh, emphasis on the lens of sharpness. It just becomes, it's a very technical thing when you start to crop really heavily like that. Yeah. So basically, if your lens is sharper, um, you get to keep more of your pictures when you can't get as close as you want. And the goal is always to get as close as possible, no matter what your lens, yeah. and fill the frame. D and we cover that in chapter eight of Stunning Digital Photography. Our wildlife chapter. If you're interested in taking wildlife photos, we cover it. We have a whole chapter on it. And that's going to make improving your skills and being patient, getting close is going to make way more of a difference than any of these lenses. Even this big $7,000 lens here, getting close will make far more of a difference. So put your time into that. But the choice of gear still matters. Yeah. And I think it's hard because I think people want to hear us say, this is the right lens or this is the right lens. And that it's just, it depends on what you're doing. If you feel like you need a zoom lens, if you're close to large mammals, for example, you might want a bit of a zoom. Um, I'm usually taking pictures of birds, so I was happier with the 400 millimeter that didn't zoom. I actually preferred that it's prime because a lot of the time the action of actually zooming your lens can introduce dust. So you're likely to get dust over time from zooming. Um, and, and that's one of the advantages here is it, it doesn't move in and out, so it doesn't get dust, which means you can buy it used because it, it, the, even the used examples are almost always completely yeah. clean because it's like sealed up and built like a tank. Yeah. So these cost about the same if you get this one used. And this, of course, is brand new, so you don't have that option. Um, and I know we're torturing the people who aren't shooting Canon because this 400 f5.6 only exists in the Canon world. Oh. And it's such an amazing lens that I, when people ask me what type of camera they should get if they're going to be a wildlife photographer, I'll often push them to get a, a Canon, Canon, specifically just for that lens. a U70, so they can jump into this because Nikon and Sony don't have a $1,000 prime. In the Nikon world, you can get the 300 f4 and put a How teleconverter much? on it. Uh, with the teleconverter, I think even used, you're probably looking at seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars. Whoa, but that's it, it a does lot good. more. And yeah, but that's way more money. It'll do sharper pictures than the zoom. Uh, okay, so still, they have options. It's still not quite that 400. This is such a great lens, and we're so lucky to have it in the Canon world. Um, 
So I think for Nikon and Sony users, I'm just going to clear in a way, go ahead and rec recommend the Tamron Zoom at that price point. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I but don't think people would be, be disappointed. In the world, check out that 400 Prime. I do like that. I also wanted to bring up how it compares to the uh, Canon 100 to 400, the Nikon 80 to 400, and the Sigma, I think it's a 200 to 500. Yeah. So Sigma, Sony, Canon, Nikon all have versions of the same kind of telephoto range, which are common wildlife. And this one is a hair sharper. And The Tamron yeah. is a hair sharper. And you, you won't actually see much benefit, uh, especially in the like 500 to 600 range, which is one of the big selling points. It's just yeah. not that sharp at 600. No, it's not. And I wouldn't recommend anybody go sell their existing zoom lens to upgrade if you have one of those models. But if you're buying new for the first time, um, I would pick the Tamron over uh, any of those other ones. So I think that's everything. I think we've covered everything. If you want to learn more about photographing wildlife, you can check out our book, Stunning Digital Photography, the number one photography book in the world. Packed with videos too, over nine hours. Nine hours? Usually you have to pay for that. <laughs> We're pretty good. If you're a gear guy and you want to learn more about lenses, for example, whether you'll be able to autofocus with a teleconverter and whether or not you should use a teleconverter yeah. in wildlife, check out my photography buying guide, all about the gear, it has a ton of information. And just like that book, constantly updated great and useful resource and if you think books suck but or if you just <laughs> learn better from video yeah we have our beginning photography dvd and blu-ray and there's a bunch of video footage that's never before seen not here on youtube not in our books so you yep should... and those are all available at amazon or at our website yes. so check them out and if you have questions if you have follow-up things that you want us to check out with these lenses just add a comment below and we will get back to you thank you don't forget to like and subscribe yeah, like Thanks and subscribe and